You may have seen when you walked in that our gross atrium looks a little bit different, that it's set up for a new program through JWell, our wellness center, called the Musaf Silent Book Club. And uh, Rabbi Alex will be teaching Torah and also teaching a little bit about the Musaf Silent Book Club. So to give people the opportunity to participate in that, those that choose, we're having our sermon and our teaching right now. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Once upon a time, there was a king who had an only daughter. The king loved his daughter more than anything in the world. From the moment she was born, she captured his heart and their bond was unbreakable. She grew and grew and blossomed and matured into a beautiful, learned young woman ready to take on the world. And the king was filled with great pride, lots of nachas. One day, a young, eligible Menchi ruler from a neighboring kingdom came to town. He fell in love with the king's daughter and they promptly got married with lots of pomp and circumstance. After some time, he wanted to go back to his home country and of course to take his new wife with him. This both overjoyed and pained our king, who was happy that his daughter had found a love match, but wanted to keep her close to home. He said to her suitor, my daughter whose hand I have given you is my only child. I can't be separated from her, but I also can't tell you not to leave. You're adults, you're her husband and she's your wife. This one favor, however, I ask of you. Everywhere you go, make me a little chamber, a little apartment, so that I can live with you both, because I cannot give up my daughter. So too, God said to the people of Israel, I am giving you the Torah. I cannot part from her, but I also cannot tell you not to take her. This one favor, however, I ask of you. Wherever you travel, make me a home wherein I may dwell. This is a midrash, a rabbinic story from Shmot Rabbah, based on Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. Make me a sanctuary and I shall dwell in your midst. It's a piece of sacred creative writing, of rabbinic fan fiction on the Torah. One of many, many such stories of God as parent, of God as king, of romance between us and Torah. In our most romantic fairy tales, the beautiful princess is a book. Is there anything more Jewish than that? The Madrashic collections, and in fact the entire Jewish literary tradition, is vast, creative, and gripping. Walk into any Beit Midrash, any Jewish house of learning, any Jewish library, and you'll see shelves and shelves and shelves of books. Books of Tanakh, that's Torah, prophets, and writings, Books of commentary on the Tanakh, 63 tractates of Mishnah and Talmud, our oral tradition, commentaries on those tractates, books of Midrash, of rabbinic storytelling, books and books and books and books of Halakha, of Jewish law, books of Hasidut and Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, books of Musar, the Jewish ethical tradition, books of prayer, books of Jewish philosophy. We are so unbelievably prolific. We are a people of the book through and through, a people of stories. And lucky for us, we were gifted Torah, the greatest story of all time. A story we read at a steady pace in our global 15 million person book club, discussing it at length every time we meet. There's a joke that synagogue is a book club that never got past the first book. So, welcome back to our weekly meetup. Parshat Shoftim is where we left off. Spoiler alert, in chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, of Dvarim, we return to the subject of kings, figureheads that intrigued the rabbis endlessly and angered God a good deal, and rightly so. We were just freed from under the thumb of a tyrant, Pharaoh, and we still need someone human to rule over us. It seems we can't just trust in God alone, but rather there is something about living in a society where having a king is the norm that makes us need it. So here in our Parsha, 
we get the laws for appointing kings in Israel. If, once we enter the land as a free people, we're so insistent that we want a king, someone to rule over us, to have that kind of absolute authority, we can. But it must be someone God chooses. It must be one of our own people. He must not have many wives or live in any kind of financial excess. And this king, when he is seated on his royal throne, he shall have a copy of this teaching, this Torah, written for him on a scroll before the Levitical priests. Let it remain with him and let him read it all his life. So that he may learn to revere the Lord his God, to observe faithfully every word of this teaching, this Torah, as well as these laws. This is what it means to be a faithful king in Israel. The Torah is your companion, your guide, when you're sitting on the throne, that highest seat of power. And many of the commentators understand this verse, this line, a copy of this Torah, of this teaching, should be written for him. They understand that to mean that he should write the scroll himself. So you as king have to be so familiar with Torah that you've written it, scribed every word, crowned the letters the way we do in Sifrut, the Jewish scribal tradition. We glorify and adorn the text. We make it sovereign, literally putting crowns on the letters. Because we are not a people of the king. We are a people of the book. And to be a good king, a good leader, you need to be well-read. Especially in Torah, but certainly beyond it. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs said in his discussion of Jewish leadership, that without constant study, leadership lacks direction and depth. This is so even in secular leadership. William Gladstone had a library of more than 30,000 books. He read more than 20,000 of them. Gladstone and Benjamin Disraeli were both prolific writers. Winston Churchill wrote some 50 books and won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Visit David Ben-Gurion's house in Tel Aviv and you will see that it is essentially a library with 20,000 books. Study makes the difference between the statesman and the politician between the transformative leader and the manager. Beyond kings and prime ministers, beyond leadership of any kind, reading is a spiritual exercise for all of us. When you are really engrossed in a book, you can travel in time, in space, from one world to the next, living out a million different lives, all without leaving your comfy armchair. Stories expand our minds and our hearts and our horizons of possibility. They let us walk in the shoes and live in the skin of the other. They tell us things we don't know, and they tell us things that we do know, but more artfully, more profoundly. Stories with power, wisdom, and divinity can be found in our most ancient texts and in new Jewish literature that is still emerging today. Stories with power, wisdom, and divinity can be found both within our rich tradition and beyond it in other faith traditions. Stories with power, wisdom, and divinity can be found in the secular world in works of nonfiction, fiction, fantasy, my favorite genre, poetry. So read what you love to read. Read widely and read often. You'll find something transformative there, and you'll be better for it. This world demand so much from every one of us. We have to be productive, to have a million extracurriculars, to be on boards, committees, to volunteer, to be good, engaged members of the community, to stay up to date with the news now that we have unprecedented access to, unprecedented access to world events as they're happening. We need to take care of our families. In whatever time is left, we try to cultivate a social life, maybe, and we forget about the self. We let the nourishment of our bodies and souls be the thing that gives. But that triage model is flawed. The self is not unimportant. Your soul cannot wait too long to be fed, or the whole system suffers. The family will suffer. The community will suffer. 
One small thing we can do for the self is read. A 2009 study at the University of Sussex found that reading can reduce stress by up to 68%. Researchers at the New School in New York City drew a strong connection between reading fiction and better performance on widely used empathy and social acumen tests. We are healthier and more human when we read. The world is such a hard place to be, especially now. And we all need to work to fix the brokenness all around us. But Shabbat gives us the opportunity to mend the cracks within, to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of the world. Right after this Dvar, I invite you to join me in the atrium for our first Musaf Silent Book Club, an hour of reading whatever you want, together in community, together in quiet camaraderie. If you connect to traditional prayer, Musaf is a wonderful opportunity to lose yourself in the world of a most precious book, the Sidur, here in this service. But if you are looking for a different kind of Musaf offering today, I invite you to bring your own book or take one off of our book cart today that has been curated for the month of Elul by Dr. Rafi Simon and lean into this cozy side of Shabbat. Because every Shabbat we put the hustle and bustle of our busy world aside for 25 hours of peace, quiet, prayer, and togetherness. Across the world, people are temporarily disconnecting from technology to connect to the present moment more deeply. One of the most universal Shabbat leisure activities is reading, immersing ourselves in worlds created by words, not unlike our own. So in our own Jewish way, we are quite naturally joining the silent book club movement, a movement of readers that began small in San Francisco back in 2012 and has grown steadily ever since. In their own words, Silent Book Club is a global community of readers with more than 1,000 chapters in 50 countries around the world led by local volunteers. Silent Book Club members gather in public at bars, cafes, bookstores, libraries, and online to read together in quiet camaraderie. Whether you join us or not, I hope you'll wear the title People of the Book proudly. Let the written word feed your soul let Torah illuminate your life with all of its sparkling crowns. Let it be one of your great loves. Shabbat Shalom.